Thanks. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I'm going to be reading from a prepared statement, and then I'll be happy to take some of your questions. I'm a gay man and a child abuse victim. Between the ages of 13 and 16, two men touched me in ways they should not have. One of those men was a priest. My relationship with my abusers is complicated by the fact that at the time, I didn't perceive what was happening as abusive. But I can look back now and see that it was. I still don't view myself as a victim, but clearly I am one. Looking back, I see the effects that this had on me. In the years after what happened, I fell into alcohol and nihilistic partying. It lasted well into my 20s. A few years ago, I realized it was time to do something good with my life. I started focusing on work, but the black comedy, the gallows humor, and the love of shock value I developed in my 20s never really went away. I've reviewed the, the tapes that appeared a few days ago in the proper context, and I don't believe that they say what is being reported. Nonetheless, I do say some things on the tapes that I do not mean and which do not reflect my views. My experiences as a victim led me to believe that I could say almost anything on this subject, no matter how outrageous. But I understand that my usual blend of sassy, gay British sarcasm, provocation and gallows humour might have come across as flippancy. A lack of care for other victims, or even worse, as seems to have been the case in reports, advocacy. I'm horrified by that impression. I would like to restate my disgust at adults who sexually abuse minors. I'm horrified by pedophilia, and I have de devoted large portions of my career to exposing child abusers. I've exposed three of them in my reporting, which is three more than most of my critics. I've repeatedly expressed disgust at pedophilia in my feature and opinion writing, and I was also the first journalist in the UK to ask, after Jimmy Savile's death, whether the real story of his rampant child abuse would ever be told. My professional record is very, very clear. But I do understand that the videos that you have seen, even though some of them were deceptively edited, paint a different picture, and I am partly to blame for that. I do not advocate for illegal behavior. I explicitly say in the tapes, in a section that was cut from the footage that you've seen, that I think the age of consent currently is about right. I do not believe that any change in the legal age of consent is justifiable or desirable. I don't believe that sex with 13-year-olds is okay. When I mentioned the number 13, I was talking about myself and the age that I lost my virginity. It can strike some Americans as unusual or strange, but my mother's native Germany, uh, you know, the age of consent is 14. Um, we have a different approach to these things sometimes in Europe. I shouldn't have used the word boy. Um, gay men often use boy or girl to mean uh, men of consenting age. But I understand how heterosexual people may not have realized that, and that was an error. I was, in fact, talking about my own relationship when I was 17 with a man who was 29. The age of consent in the UK is 16. I did say that there are relationships between older gay men and younger gay men that can help the, the younger gay man escape from a lack of support or understanding at home. That's perfectly true, and every gay man knows it. I'm certainly guilty of imprecise language, which I regret. And anyone who suggests, however, that I turn a blind eye to illegal activity or to the abuse of minors is unequivocally wrong. I'm implacably opposed to the normalization of pedophilia, and I will continue to report and speak accordingly. To repeat, I do not support child abuse. It's a disgusting crime of which I have personally been a victim. The remarks I made on podcasts and interviews more than a year ago were about my personal life experiences, but I didn't make that clear. I will not apologize for dealing with my life experiences in the way that I choose to, which is through humor and provocation. No one can tell me or anyone else who has lived through these experiences how they should best deal with those emotions. But I am sorry to other abuse victims who may have interpreted what I said as flippant or uncaring if my own personal way of dealing with what happened to me has hurt you. I will never stop making jokes about taboo subjects. Go into any drag bar or gay club and you will hear joke after joke after joke about clerical sexual abuse. I'm not afforded the same freedom to make those kinds of jokes because the media chooses to selectively define me as a political figure in some circumstances and a comedian in others. And also, of course, because I'm a conservative. But I said some things on those internet live streams that were simply wrong. 
My employer, Breitbart News, has stood by me while others caved. They've allowed me to carry conservative and libertarian ideas to communities that would otherwise never have had them. They have been a significant factor in my success, and I'm grateful for the freedom and for the friendships that I forged there. But I would be wrong to allow my poor choice of words to detract from my colleagues' important job, which is why today I'm resigning from Breitbart Effective immediately. This decision is mine alone. When your friends have done right by you, it's only right to do right by them. And for me, that means stepping aside so my colleagues at Breitbart can get back to the great work they do. My book, Dangerous, um, has received interest from other publishers after my previous publisher, Simon and Schuster, informed me they no longer wish to release it. The book will come out this year as planned, with perhaps an additional chapter. I'll be denoting 10% of my royalties to child sex abuse charities. I haven't ever apologized before, and I don't anticipate ever doing it again. Name-calling doesn't bother me, and misreporting doesn't bother me, but to be a victim of child abuse and at the same time be accused of being an apologist for child abuse is absurd. I regret the things that I said. I don't think I've been as sorry about anything my whole life, and this isn't how I wanted my parents to find out about this either. But let's be clear about what's happening here. This is a cynical media witch hunt from people who do not care about children. They care about destroying me and my career and, by extension, my allies. They know that although I made some outrageous statements, I've never actually done anything wrong. They held this story back. They held the footage back. Footage has been out there in the wild for over a year because they don't care about victims. They don't care about children. They only care about bringing me down. They will fail. I will, in the next couple of weeks, be announcing a new independently funded media venture of my own and a live tour in the coming weeks and new campus tour dates, part of my new Troll Academy tour. I started my career as a technology reporter who wrote about politics, but I have since mutated and grown into something quite different and much bigger. I'm now a performer with millions of fans in America and beyond. I'm grateful for the tens of thousands of messages that I have received. And I look forward to making you all laugh, cry, and think for many, many decades to come. My full focus is now going to be on entertaining and educating everyone, left, right, and otherwise. If you want to brand or stereotype me, good luck with that. Don't think for a moment that anything that has happened in the last 48 hours will ever stop me being as offensive, provocative, and outrageously funny as I choose on any subject I please. America has a colossal free speech problem. The land of the First Amendment has some of the most oppressive social restrictions on free expression anywhere in the Western world. I'm proud to be a warrior for free speech and creative expression, and I want everyone in America to have the right to do, be, say, read anything. I want people to be able to dress however they want. I want people to be able to play whatever video games they want. I want people to realize their potential and have the full limits of creative expression available to them. That isn't currently the case in America. America is a country I love. America is a country that has taken me in. Its people have taken me in, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I am proud to be a free speech warrior in America, and I will continue to do that. Um, I'm not going anywhere. Thank you very much. I will uh, take perhaps five questions. Uh, my yeah. So, in an interview you did with Nightline, with us at ABC, you said you never say anything you don't believe. Yes. So what you said in that podcast, do you believe that? And what exactly is this about? Is this an apology? Is this about you? Or is it about that you no longer have a book deal and you no longer are speaking at, at CPAC? Um, this is about me apologizing for saying things I did not mean. Um, this is... Um, me apologizing to other victims of abuse for comments that may be perceived by them as insensitive or flippant, which was unintended. Um, you know, you sort of freewheel and spitball in these, you know, boozy, long, late night internet uh, live streams. You know, some of them go on for three, four hours. And you play with ideas, and sometimes these things come out half baked, and that, or they're expressed in ways you didn't intend. For the most part, I do not believe that this, these videos show what um, reporting claims that they show. But for those statements I did make um, where I misspoke, I'm here today to apologize. We spoke with some of the organizers of the Berkeley protests, and they say what is happening right now, what you just said, and what's happening to you in the mainstream media, mm -hmm. that this is a victory for them. Because without those protests, without shutting you down, mm -hmm. the mainstream media would have never looked at you with a microscope. What do you mm -hmm. say to that? Um, well, 
this isn't really about me crowing, but I, I don't think this has done any harm for my profile. And I think you know, more people are going to read what I have to say on the subject of free speech as a result of this. It may not be from the same publisher, and it may not be from the same, under the same masthead. Um, but I have an opportunity now through what has happened, um, and this has not been a pleasant 48 hours for me. Um, I have an opportunity now through what has happened to reach an even larger audience, um, and I intend to do so. My um, could, could you, be, could you uh, be respectful of other people, please? No. I'm on, uh, an o I'm on an O1B, uh, Alien of Extraordinary Ability. Uh, yeah. I'm looking at the scene here. I'm not sure that we could have a news conference with researchers talking about curing cancer and we would have as much, as much turnout here. Yes. What does this tell us about our culture? That there is so much interest about you, yes. about this controversy, yes. and about what's happened over the last month from Berkeley to this point. Well, I think it says something very obvious and very clear, which is that America has a gigantic free speech problem. Um, both the left and the right are guilty of that. In the 90s, it was the religious right saying that video games could uh, make you violent. Now it is feminists and social justice warriors saying video games can make you sexist. And all of the associated forms of um, uh, school marmishness and nannying and pearl clutching, language policing, the safe space culture, trigger warnings culture, all of this stuff um, is designed to restrict the free expression of the rest of America, and it is perpetrated by elites on the people. It is perpetrated by well-funded, well-educated people in coastal cities on the rest of us, um, on perfectly innocent pursuits and perfectly innocent expressions and perfectly innocent language. Um, my rapid rise in the last year, I think, is testament to the huge hunger from both sides, because um, I've got to tell you, most of the people at my talks are not your typical college Republicans. Um, my rise and the interest in this story is testament to the fact that America is crying out for somebody who will say the unsayable, who will break taboos, um, and who resists, who fearlessly resists um, those who want to, to clamp down on free speech and free expression. Um, that's, that's what I think it says, and I think it's very clear. Just a quick follow-up. Okay. Are you at all concerned that while you've been sort of straddling the line, walking up to the line, you've now crossed over the line into a place of irrelevancy? No. Um, if I thought that that was the case, I, I wouldn't be making an appeal uh, now. That's why you would be making an appeal. Well, no. If, if I thought I'd cross the line over into irrelevancy, then I would uh, be with my tail between my legs somewhere. Um, I'm apologizing for uh, a small cluster of remarks that I made, some of which I think are taken out of context. There was obviously some deceptive editing that happened there. Um, one or two of those comments I did not mean. They did not reflect my beliefs. Um, and I think, you know, I've never apologized about anything else before. I don't anticipate doing it again. But this particular subject strikes pretty close to home for me. So I, it, was very, it was very important for me to clarify my position on this particular subject, given my personal history with it. Do you stand by your comments on calling Joe Berg? Sorry, say again. Thank you. Um, NBC News. Do you think that there are homophobic undertones? The fact that this particular topic is the one that finally crossed the line. Um, given that gay men have historically been equated with pedophilia, mm -hmm. and given that you have uh, done some rather controversial things in the past. Well, statistically speaking, there, uh, you know, there's, there's no evidence to suppose that pedophilia and homosexuality are related, though I, I think that the numbers show a slight uh, uh, preponderance. Um, I think I think pedophiles are slightly more likely to be gay. That is to say, slightly more likely to be in, into boys if they're men than into girls, um, but not by very much. Um, I I know that CPAC has a long and complex history with with gays. I know that the, one of the organisers of CPAC was fired for trying to welcome you know log cabin Republicans into the tent. Um, I know that there've been a lot of problems with CPAC and, and homosexuals. Um, I. I think if you look at the crowds that follow me around, you know, Louisiana State University, we filled a 1,200-seater in 48 hours. I came out in drag, in full drag, as a drag queen, to give a talk about fat shaming. And 1,200 Republicans gave me a standing ovation. This simply hasn't happened in the history of this country before. And I'm very proud to be introducing what I would consider to be normal gays to, you know, Republican and conservative America. We don't all have to be like, you know... The, the, the stereotype, the pink suit and, um, and ludicrousness of, of a lot of gays that you see on television. The, you know, I think if there's a problem, it's the way that gays are represented on TV. I've probably done more for the image of gays in the flyover states than you know, all the associated 
than, than all of the gay charities, um, gay activist groups and gay publications for the last 30 years. I think they've seen me, and I get emails every day along these lines. They've seen me and they've realized, I get emails from mothers sometimes, and they say, my son is gay and I was terrified that he was going to turn into Ross Matthews. Um, but you've made me realize actually that gay people can, can, can be okay. Um, I'm very proud of that and very happy of that, uh, for that. If there's any, if there's any, um, if there's any extent to which homophobia played into CPAC's decision, I certainly wasn't aware of it. And I know that many people within CPAC have been very supportive of me appearing there. Um, I'm not a traditional represent representative for American conservatism. I've never painted myself that way. I'm a vis visitor to this country. All I can really do is express my opinion having been here for a year and a half. Um, but given the level of interest, the sheer number of people who, who seem to love me um, and, and who want to you know, buy my book and come to my shows and all that kind of thing, um, I think it was only logical that CPAC would, would seek to book somebody like that, who's somebody who is obviously the most interesting thing happening in American conservatism right now. Yes. Yes. No, I don't. I don't intend to go head to head with Breitbart in any in any respect whatsoever. But I will be doing a lot more of the same that I have been doing, just not under the Breitbart banner. Um, we have received some. Um, preliminary funding for that, I expect to be, to be raising more. Um, I think it'll just be more of the same. College tours, probably commercial tours, more TV, more video, more everything. Um, I'm going to focus now you know, on, on entertainment, on education, and less perhaps on journalism. I've sort of outgrown my role, I think, as technology editor at Breitbart, which is fairly obvious. Um, I'm, going to be, um, foc I'm going to be doubling down on education and entertainment um, and see where it takes me in the next year. I can do one or two more. Yeah. Um, okay, so we at the Gateway Pundit uh, discovered that the uh, original attacks uh, on you came from two key sources. Uh, Democratic activists with key ties to George Soros, in addition to uh, former presidential candidate Evan McMullen and the CPAC. Uh, so these Never Trump websites and individuals continue to invest vast amounts of money and time in attacking uh, Trump supporters and members of the uh, current administration. <coughs> Uh, my two questions would be, what do you think of these uh, anti-Trump groups and their continued attacks? And uh, my second one is, do you think that these groups have any future in the Republican Party? What would you say to them? Um, publications and activist groups um, and uh, political operatives who insist on uh, preserving their own power. These are people who have sold out your country to line their own pockets. Um, these people are dying, if not already dead. Their publications have no readers. They're, um, you know, it's very obvious that this was a highly coordinated and very well planned and well funded attack on me. But I have to take responsibility for what I said. Nonetheless, everyone at home can see what's happening. And everyone at home can appreciate when, you know, Donald Trump is voted into the White House, but the whole Republican Party absolutely hates him, that something has to change. There, there has to be a break at some point. This sort of populist nationalist revolution that is happening, the anti-political correctness, pro-free speech revolution that is happening all over the Western world is not going anywhere. For the last 30 years, um, speech codes have been the order of the day, and right-wing politicians have run terrified and screaming for our allegations of racism and sexism, and basically given ground on almost every serious issue. Well, that's changing um, with the rise of bold, ele bold electorates and bold politicians. Donald Trump's an example of that. I'm an example of a cultural figure related to that, that social change. And we are going to represent the next 30 years. This, this last 40 hours has been a horrible and humiliating and degrading experience for me. Um, but I'm going to be around for 30 years. Many of the people who are organizing everything they possibly can to take me down will not be. Um, I'll do one or two more. We've, we've had you, so I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Milo, may I talk to you about, first of all, I'm going to let you know, although I detest everything about NAMBLO, <coughs> the FBI actually agrees with you. When it comes to criminal classification, victims who are 10 or 12 years old actually can grant consent. If you would, please pass it to the gentleman visiting from NAMBLO. Sorry. Um, well, i just like to clarify there. I said in a... In a in a segment of the video that was cut, which most of you will not have seen, that I felt that the age of consent was, I quote, about right, unquote. Uh, I have no desire or wish, I don't think it's desirable or justifiable to change the age of consent. I think the age of consent in my mom's native Germany at 14 is too young. Okay, 
So one question I have is on behalf of the state of Texas. You do write, you do issue very provocative statements. And yep. This is one that you said that is very offensive and messes with Texas. You said gay marriage is not a civil rights struggle. Stop comparing gays and blacks. When gay men are slaves, it's because we beg to be. Yes. I'm going to tell you the 1964 Civil Rights Act was signed by the greatest president of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson. He's a Texan. He signed it because Texas is next to Mexico, which is very close to your daddy's precious wall. He signed that because Mexicans were showing up to workplaces and white men were uh, intimidating and physically abusing them. Civil Rights Act was never, ever intended specifically for blacks only. Lyndon Baines Johnson included it for discriminatory purposes. Your argument is not only unoriginal and adios American ish, it's also ignorant and racist. I was wondering if you could please rip off this statement or do you have a leg to stand on to uh, I think it was a funny joke and I stand by it and I don't take comparisons to Ann Coulter to be insulting. She sells a hell of a lot of books. Uh, yeah. Um, I, we, uh, there's been interest, um, obviously, since uh, Simon & Schuster decided at the first opportunity to jettison it. Uh, I'm sure they'll get a lot of pl plaudits in uh, New York cocktail parties, but the people who actually want to read it, the people who support me and believe in what I'm saying, um, in their millions, um, will, uh, I'm sure, seek out wherever it is published by the, 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 next, the next person. Um, we expect to be able to announce something about that in the next couple of weeks. The book, the book, the book will come out... Um, the book will come out this year as planned. Uh, I don't think that's clear yet.